you guys are getting a lot of me tonight, but I just had to introduce these guys because um, it's um, I'm just thrilled that they're here presenting tonight. Christina can tell you how I've been chasing her down to try and get her to do this presentation for a very long time. So we're ha we're very happy to have both Christina and Eric. And I'm going to read through their bios, um, and then I will um, pass it off to Eric. Eric's going to share share his screen. And Eric, if you want to go ahead and just start sharing your screen now, that's fine. Okay. So I'm going to read Christina's first and then end with Eric because I don't want to interrupt the program as we're going. So born and raised in the foothills of the Rockies in Colorado, Christina Bear finds fulfillment in serving her community. She has recently graduated from high school, Colorado Academy in Denver where she ran varsity cross country and served on the youth philanthropy board in her school. Christina is headed to Cambridge, Massachusetts this fall to attend Harvard University, and she hopes to major in environmental studies, public policy, and computer science. Christina's motto is think global, act local. A Girl Scout for life, she earned her gold award while teaching minority students computer programming and technology skills. Locally, she has served on the Board of Seeds of South Sudan, a nonprofit dedicated to the education of orphans from the genocide in Sudan. She traveled to Senegal in 2013, where she and her schoolmates built a library in a remote village in order to increase literacy. Her community service consists of social and environmental activism. And from 2010 to 2012, Christina did a radon awareness project, or RAP, with Eric to educate their neighbors about the dangers of radon and the associated risks of lung cancer. And I'll include the, the link for that in the chat a little, a little bit later. Their advocacy grew in the state of Colorado at city councils, state health department, and state capital and included public policy. Christina and Eric were honored by several national awards for their work on radon awareness, including receiving the President's Environmental Youth Award. For the past two summers, Christina has worked as a research fellowship, uh, in a research fellowship at the National Institutes for Health to study DNA changes in bacteria and the development of antibiotic resistance. An avid hiker and Colorado uh, mountain climber, Eric Bear is presently a junior at Colorado Academy in Denver. He plays varsity soccer and is involved in Amnesty, Amnesty International and mock trial in high school. A Star Scout and Boy Scouts, Eric serves as a patrol leader for his troop in Golden, Colorado, along with his favorite subjects sorry, <laughs> of computer science, math, and physics. Eric has a deep passion for theater. He acts in school plays and musicals, most recently in the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. He loves debate and dialogue in American history, a persuasive writing in English class, and he's committed to round out his science interests with exposure to hum humanities and literature. In 2014, Eric traveled to Costa Rica, where he lived with a family on their farm and was struck by the need for clean water in rural areas. Last summer, sparked by his desire to build a water filtration device in an engineering camp, Eric did a student-led project where he built a hybrid water treatment apparatus with biosand filter and a solar powered chlorine producing unit. He cleaned samples of water from the Cherry Creek Reserve, or River to test his fil filtration device. And he won first place in the Denver Science Fair category for environmental engineering and special awards, including from the US Army. This summer, Eric was invited as a Phillips Scholar with the Air Force Research Lab in the Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he's working in the directed energy section. He is also doing a virtual internship on particle accelerator and ion beams using, used in radiation treatment of cancer with the physics department of Colorado State University. Eric loves national parks and this summer was particularly fun as he traveled to the Grand, Ta Grand Canyon, Carlsbad Caves and Bandelier National Monument. And I'm very pleased to introduce, introduce Eric Bear. Thank you so much, you guys. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Eric, and I'm mostly going to focus on the water treatment system that I built last summer. And the, the basic idea was a hybrid system that would incorporate different processes to filter water. And in the end, that's just 
my effort to be able to safeguard how we make potable water. So I, I'll give a little bit more background as to how I got into water because it's strange to see, oh, there's this boy in Colorado and he's into water, why? And so you guys heard a little bit about the Radon Awareness Project. Um, this was basically spreading the word via media to test for radon and get it out however we could, which was through newspapers and TV and through articles, however we could do anything to reach the people through a grassroots approach. And that just kind of gives me a, an eye for the environment. That's not too much into water at all, but then in sixth grade, um, my class curriculum required that we did something called the Global Water Project. And although it was required, um, I w got really passionate about studying arsenic contamination in Bangladesh. Now, it wasn't that we were going to solve the world problems, but this awareness led to a greater vision for where water plays a role in everybody's lives. And so from there on, I had more of a scope for where water applies to. And lastly, as um, Eve said, I took a trip to Costa Rica and I got to stay with the homestay family, but we weren't allowed to drink the water that the city used because, or the village used, because they got it from a river, which was usually clean, but when it wasn't, they'd be using city contaminated water with chemicals and different contaminants without any sustainable methods for water treatment. And this is a big eye opener. I thought that, well, this is a, this is a sign. I mean, is there a way that I can make a difference or at least find a way to filter water that could work for a small community? And so that's where the purpose comes in for my project. Now, I'll give you a little bit more background on who I am because, I mean, just, I, you guys heard a little bit about me. I'm, I play soccer, I love theater, I love to act. I'm a boy scout, I do mock trial, I play some instruments, ukulele and piano, primarily. I, Oh, mock trials on there twice, whoops. Um, and my passions in school are math and science as well as programming. So last summer, it was that math and science that really led to this water treatment system. The goal was, how can we design something that's practical, that's cost effective, it's easy to use, and it's sustainable? Now, these are just some attributes that you want of a water treatment system, but if you want it to be truly effective in doing what it's supposed to do, you, won't, you should combine the three different methods for treating water. These are biological, physical, and chemical. With these things in mind, I went about creating this water treatment system, and I also wanted to test it. So here are the materials that I used when conducting these tests. I got three gallons of water from different times at different places in the Cherry Creek River, running straight through Denver, so that would kind of simulate a, any city contaminated water. Then I had my biosand filter and as well as my electrolysis unit that produced chlorine. Additionally, I needed some, um, some tap water and salt, which are actually the materials used to create the chlorine. I needed some gallon buckets, some containers for the water while filtering it, and a pipette to add that chlorine producing unit uh, solution. Lastly, I needed something to test the efficacy of how my design actually worked. And so I used a total dissolved solids, TDS, as you can see on the screen, um, monitor to find out what the total dissolved solids are in the water before and after. Some Tetra test strips, which are used to find nitrate, nitrite, chlorine, pH, alkalinity, and hardness. These are all crucial factors when considering water quality. And my aim was to get my water from above the EPA standard into the ideal range for potable water. Lastly, I need to consider bacteria because that's always something to consider. So here is a little bit about how I made the biosand filter. There's two designs on the bottom. There's one that shows what's inside the filter. It's primarily uh, fine grain sand, a little bit of gravel, and some perforated disks between each of the layers. Now on the um, right, Bottom corner, you can see a SketchUp model that I made. These 3D renders were really important because the engineers that are, I was working with required that I have extensive planning so that I could make sure that my design would work. Ultimately, it required that I made some type of stabilizing mechanism. So say you place this in a rural community, it might not have the proper 
sustainable methods if it's just going to be a standalone tube. And so in the end, my design turned out to be what you see on the top with the stabilizing mechanism, the water, and the filtration happening in real time. Next, I'm going to show you guys the electrochlorination unit. This is something that I found on the internet. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I found it on the internet as a base model of how it can take salt water, everyday ta table salt, and turn that into something that can clean water. It's a crazy idea, but with the chemical processes that you can do with electrolysis, it makes it possible. <clears throat> so I took the materials that you see on the bottom left and I made it into the filter that you see on the right. <coughs> Excuse me, a little bit of a dry throat. And then on the top right, you can see how much water and how much table salt it takes to make this solution. It's only five ounces, and this scales up to about 500 gallons of purifying water. Next, I'll tell you about the methodologies for testing. Um, like I said, I had to con construct my treatment system. I had to get the three different gallons of water. I had to treat, treat it using the biosand filtration as long, or along with the chlorine, and then afterwards test it for those various things that I mentioned before. So I'll, I'll show you a few more pictures just to give you a little bit of that, the idea of the procedure. First, I need to make the purifying solution. So it's kind of a, a preparation phase where you'll take your salt water, a very small amount of it, and you run it three or five times through the electrolysis unit. This produces something called sodium hypochlorite, which is, it is it's similar to bleach, about half as concentrated, and it's not going to really damage your health at all because that's the exact opposite of what I want. So once I got the water, I recorded the levels of where these contaminants were at, so I could get a before and after picture. Then I treated the three separate gallons of water um, by filtering them through my biosand filter, then adding the drops of the purifying solution. Lastly, I tested these and recorded the levels of change and where the contaminants led to. I'll show you many of the graphs that were uh, impressive. Some of them are ones that I won't show you, but I have at the end of the presentation just in case. Those are ones where the levels were either starting within the range or just didn't move much and so it remained safe. But here's one um, nitrate, which is something that is very bad for your immune system and your digestive system. It turns out in all three trials, my water filtration system, along with the, um, the purifying solution, was able to remove all nitrate contaminants, making it into the EPA range. Next, I have hardness, which is something that um, continues to hurt your immune system as you grow with age. And considering wherever this would be applied or implemented, this is a big factor to consider if it's going to be scaled for an entire community. So in all three cases, um, my water started at a pretty dangerous hardness level, but throughout the process, I got it all into the EPA range. Next, I have chlorine. And you're probably thinking, okay, this, this Katie makes a chlorine producing unit. We don't want chlorine in our water. <clears throat> now the thing, that, that was something I really needed to consider. And in only one trial did the level of chlorine raise to, once again, a safe level within the EPA range. But this ensures that if you do use this type of method for water treatment, it's not going to hurt you. It's going to help you. Next, we have alkalinity, which is a, a strange range. It's kind of like pH, where you want it in a middle area. And while treating the water, I had some, some weird results where either it started in the range and went below, or it started out of the range and went in. But th for all three, they were in the ideal range. <coughs> and then this is kind of the crown jewel, like I was talking about. Total dissolved solids is a very big part of what the EPA tests. They have several different um, standards. You, from zero to 500 is potable. But within that, as you can see on the bottom, there's distilled water, there's aquifer water, there's mountain springs, there's hard water, and then there's tap water. And past 500 is, is unsafe to drink and 
this was a this was probably the biggest part of my testing and i was happy to find that in all three trials the system safeguarded itself by lowering the levels to all within tap water not just unfiltered tap water but to a very safe level um, similar to what comes out of your sink and so i was pretty excited about that and that gave me a very good result now i'll tell you about the conclusions as you saw from those graphs um, my water treatment system was very successful when it removed nitrate and another compound that is very chemically similar called nitrite into the epa levels it also decreased the hardness, pH, and alkalinity into the ideal levels. As you saw, there's kind of some gray area where you're above and below, which can both be bad, but in all cases, it was in the middle. And then lastly, the crown jewel, of course, it got total dissolved solids above the, or it got it below the maximum parts per million into the potable water range. And lastly, I didn't have a graph for this because it was a, um, a yes or no but the bacteria test did return negative when I tested it in all three iterations. So now just to provide some applicability for this project, like I said, it, the inspiration came from a small community. This idea would work in a small community. So I, I propose that with the hybrid design, it safeguards how clean your water is with all three different types, biological, physical, and chemical and it has a large output suitable for not only a family or household, but moreover a community. And that's really where we're aiming at. Um, just to give you some future scope because the project's not necessarily done, I have done some testing and have some results, but with more resources I can test for heavy metals and I can compare those to EPA standards. Also, I can test different water sources because I'm not only going to be using this for the Cherry Creek River, but rather other places. And that's about how much I can give you in a, a brief amount of time, but um, here are some references. I'm sure you don't want to read them, but um, these are just some of the people and the websites that helped me with the design. And in the end, I, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out, but I'm also still curious to see what it can do as I continue on. And I have some uh, fancy little stuff at the end if there's time for questions afterwards, but that's what I've got. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, and we're going to move right along to Christina's Prezi. I, I didn't tell everybody, but Christina had her wisdom teeth pulled yesterday, so she's going to try to do as little talking as possible, and we're hoping that um, this presentation works. We tested it beforehand, and it seemed like it would be okay. So we're gonna give it a go. Hi, my name is Christina. Mm -hmm. I'm a rising freshman at Harvard University. Thank you for inviting me and my brother, Eric, to speak today about our awareness project on radon. I think you might have to press the next slide for it to. Okay. I'm not sure. All right. I might not be able to. Let me just try something here. Sorry. Of course. Let me get to the actual presentation. Hope I don't have to do that forever. We'll try. We'll try going. As well as my brother's project for clean water. Today, I have two objectives to accomplish. The first is to tell you what radon is. And the second is to tell you how youth can accomplish outreach. Let's start out with a little background about myself. I'm from a small city called Golden just west of Denver, in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. There are 300 days of sunshine, but also some intense snow. This is the view from my backyard in the midst of winter. 
So how did we get interested in radon? In 2007, on a snowy day, my brother and I were looking on the internet when we found the radon poster contest. This was a national contest, but the extent of our participation was just state level. I started to do some research, and when I asked my parents, they had very little idea of what radon is. They heard about it when they bought our house, but didn't think much of it. I decided to participate in the contest, so I drew a pair of lungs and put facts about radon inside. My slogan was, keep your radar out for radon. For my poster, my state health department awarded me first place in Colorado. They said they wanted to use it for outreach, and I was certainly on board with that. Here's a picture of my poster. I covered very basic facts on my poster, such as incidents and effects of radon. Following in my footsteps, my brother also did a poster with the motto, Detect to Protect, in 2009. Both of us thought it was a very interesting topic because we often played in our basement, the most common location of home radon, especially in the winter. After some more research, we found how radon specifically affects kids. We found that children have rapidly growing cells and ever-changing DNA. They also have heightened sensitivity to pollutants and they are also exposed to unintended secondhand smoke. We decided to do a neighborhood study, which wasn't very sophisticated, but we wanted to know what homeowners were doing about radon where we live, where levels are above 6.5 picocuries per liter on average, where 4, 4 picocuries per liter is the action level. We surveyed 32 households with this super short survey and then educated them a little bit about radon. We found that 93% gained knowledge of radon after we educated them. 59% said that they would test. 96% would mitigate if their level was over four picocuries per liter. Little did we know, our state was also doing a study. It was a bit more sophisticated because they studied age groups, income level, race, and other demographic groups. When asked, has your house been tested for radon? A lot of people over all demographics said no. After our kids survey and our state study, it was evident that a poster was not enough to educate the state but it was certainly a springboard to start an awareness project. Let me take a step back to explain to you what radon is. Radon is a heavy noble gas in the periodic table and is radioactive. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking, but it is preventable. You cannot taste it, smell it, or see it, making it virtually undetectable. Radon comes from decay of radium, which comes from uranium underground. The primary source of radon is indoor air and some from water as well. To reach citizens on an understanding level, we created a cloud or Wilson chamber. It is a particle detector used for detecting ionizing radiation. Radon and its daughters release alpha and beta particles, which ultimately end up damaging your lungs. Here are the parts of our cloud chamber. Alcohol, dry ice, a metal plate with an airtight jar, and a radioactive source. We used an old Coleman lantern mantle. Who knew they were radioactive? The cloud chamber shows mostly beta particles, which in a short video, in a 
following video are the longer ones, but there are also some alpha particles, which are the shorter ones. Radon decay products attach to particles, dust, or smoke, and get into your lungs. Alpha particles can enter a nucleus and break the structure of DNA, leading to mutations, transformation, and cancer. Single or double strand breaks can occur, and this is a dose-related effect. It can take anywhere between 5 and 25 years of exposure for these DNA changes to take place. Lung cancer is the result of long-term exposure to radon. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking, but it is preventable. Levels as low as 1.25 picocuries per liter can give you lung cancer. Statistics in 2010 showed that 200,000 people were diagnosed with lung cancer, and there were almost 1,600 deaths. Smoking rates have decreased, leading to lung cancer incidence decreasing, but lung is still the number one cancer. The graph to the right shows relative deaths of other causes in comparison to deaths caused by radon. As you can see, Radon far outweighs drowning, falls, fires in homes, and drunk driving. That is why it is so important to test. There are two different kinds of radon tests, short-term and long-term. Short-term tests can take about five to seven days, where long-term tests take three to 12 months. If your radon levels are above four picocuries per liter, there are several methods of mitigation. Some of these include sub-slab depressurization, a fan and a pipe, and sealing foundational cracks and pipes. In learning about radon, Eric and I came across a study done on Navajo Indians. Many Navajo miners lived and worked in the Four Corners region, working in uranium mines. These miners were paid minimum wage and were uneducated about the dangers of radon present in the uranium mines. These were the only jobs they could do and that were available to them, and they worked day in and day out. These miners had a relative risk of 29 for lung cancer from radon. So, we had done all the research, but we decided that we needed to speak out about it. Brainstorming was our first step, and we asked for radon leaders to get into one room to discuss and share outreach methods and their best practices. So, on November 16th, 2010, we met with those radon leaders. We met with the American Lung Association, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Together, we formed a common mission to spread awareness. Most of our collaboration was with the State Health Department. CDPHE was also very important in educating Eric and I about radon and how to go about awareness. It was the State Health Department that actually had the radon poster contest in the first place, where all of this got started. The American Lung Association was receptive, and as, as a result of our initial meeting, they put radon information on their website. The American Lung Association got us hooked up to community activities, such as a stair climb, and a Run the Rocks event 
at Colorado's famous Red Rocks. We were fortunate that the Region 8 EPA office was situated in Denver, making working with the EPA an easy task. We also worked with CANSAR, which is a nonprofit voice for cancer survivors against radon. The picture on the left is Eric and I at a Healthy Homes conference with CANSAR. We also worked with Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity came later into our collaboration when they were building two new homes in Golden, and they made them radon resistant. So how did we grow our project? We realized that posters were not enough. And with our collaborators, we are ready to spread awareness. I started going, Eric and I started by going to city councils. And we spoke at the public forums and asked the mayor and council what they were doing about radon, what policies and laws they had, and how they're educating the homeowners in their cities. We attended community events, which we found to be an integral part of outreach and educated the attendees. The picture on the bottom left shows our booth at the American Lung Association stair climb, where we were able to reach over 2,500 people. We educated, handed out information, and, survey, and surveyed. We also joined rallies at our state capital in January pictured in the right top corner. January is National Radon Action Month, and these rallies had speakers such as cancer survivors, kids, and legislators. One time, Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper came to see the rally. We also formed a team of the Radon Stamp Stompers to fundraise at Run the Rock. We also decided to reach out on a county level. Eric and I spoke to my Girl Scout troop about the, our Radon Awareness Project. I also spoke to female Colorado legislators on the 100th anniversary of Girl Scouts in 2012. We both spoke to a local 4-H troop about our project. So what were some of our methods of outreach? Well, we started with the poster, and then we made brochures and handouts, and finally a website. Our website is radonawarenessproject.com. Then, the newspapers found us, and we found them. Here are just a few from the Golden newspaper called the Golden Transcript, the Denver Post, which is our state newspaper, and Time for Kids. We also initiated a House Bill 121165 in 2013. This bill made it so radon testing had to be done before a home is sold. Here we are working on the bill and testifying. It was a valiant effort to start the process, but unfortunately, the bill did not pass. However, we did get the ball rolling on radon legislation and learned about the intricacies of engineering a bill. We, another form of outreach was that we sent letters to 500 schools to get more kids involved in the radon poster con. A big, a big thing that Eric and I learned from doing the radon awareness project was the concept of bottom-up and top-down awareness. Top down means formal learning and legislation. Bottom up means involving youth, informal learning, everyday integrated education, community involvement, and grassroots. You need both for effective awareness. The CDC is very involved with radar here in Colorado. They recently a $1.5 million grant to Boulder Public Health to study the effects of radon. So what's the big picture? The big picture is that 
Eric and I learned from doing this project on radon and environmental awareness is that one cancer is prevented, potentially prevented if one does not smoke and mitigates radon. We learned that children can be ambassadors for environmental hazards, not alarmists, but just aware of what they breathe, the water they drink. When grassroots efforts combined with legislative efforts, awareness is accomplished. I was curious about DNA and damage and repair after doing the Radon Awareness Project. So, two summers ago, I applied to the National Institutes of Health to be a summer intern. So for the past two summers, I worked on antibiotic resistance in tuberculosis and E. coli. And while that was a slight branch off of radon, I still got to immerse myself in the bench science of DNA damage and repair. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christina and Eric. Those were amazing presentations. And um, now we can go into um, Q&A and I'm going to briefly stop recording.